Good evening, and welcome to the Sinister Wisdom launch of Sinister Wisdom 129, Fire-Rimmed Eden, Selected Poems of Lynn Lonadier. My name is Shramona Mundo, and it is my total pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Before we begin, I want to spend a moment for a land acknowledgement. We are all around the world on indigenous lands, and those of us in the U.S. are on occupied unceded land. I am joining from occupied Muskogee land at Emory University's campus, which was acquired through the violent displacement and theft of homes and peoples. And the struggle against the violence is ongoing in Atlanta and in South DeKalb uh, with our fight for the Wolani forest and against gentrification and the building of Cop City. Please join us in inserting into the chat where you are joining us from and acknowledge with us the land and solidarities with decolonial struggles where you are located. Thank you. We have an hour of celebration planned and we will wrap up, wrap up around 8 p.m. on the East Coast, including time for our traditional dance number at the end. Um, and to get us started, uh, let me tell you a bit about Sinister Wisdom. In case you are not familiar, with our lovely publication, Sinister Wisdom is a qu quarterly journal of lesbian literature and art. Sinister Wisdom started in 1976 and has been publishing consistently since. And tonight we are celebrating our summer issue, Sinister Wisdom 129, Fire Rimmed Eden, Selected Poems of Lynn Lonadier. Thank you also to our event partner and my neighbor, Karis Books and More, the South's oldest feminist bookstore based here in Decatur, Georgia. Thank you again for sponsoring us. Um, the fall issue is coming soon along for anyone who's waiting and it will come with a special bonus issue that um, donors to Sinister Wisdom funded over the summer. Thank you so much to our donors. And if you are not currently already a subscriber, I encourage you to sign up for a subscription today by going to www.sinisterwisdom.org slash subscribe. The link will be in the chat as well. A group of monthly sustainers are vital to Sinister Wisdom. If you can give monthly to Sinister Wisdom, please sign up as a sustainer at sinisterwisdom.org slash sustainers. Another link that will be in the chat, thanks to Max. Um, Julie Enzer sends us uh, emails every month when, you, uh, when your gift comes in with behind the scenes details and new information about what we have coming for the journal. Um, and before we move on, a few housekeeping notes. First, please keep your microphone muted throughout the program. If we detect noise from you, we will have to mute you ourselves. Um, and we apologize and um, thank you for your um, thank you for your cooperation with us. Remember, there will be an opportunity to unmute and wave and share at the end of our program this evening. Um, as the program proceeds, if you want to show appreciation for the readers, wave your hands at the end of each reading, or use the reaction emojis on Zoom. And you can go ahead and test that now with us. And feel free to light the uh, chat up with your comments and questions and celebrations. Sometimes the best things of our events are happening in the chat. So look forward to the chat. And if you need any technical assistance this evening, you can chat with Max, who is on tap for technical assistance. And they're waving their hands. Um, we are recording the event this evening and we'll make it available starting tomorrow or Thursday at sinisterwisdom.org slash Lynn Lonadier. And I'm very excited for the program. So without further delay, we shall begin. Sinister Wisdom's editor and publisher, our lovely Julie Enser, has been working with the poems of Lynn Lonadier for the past decade. During the time she has been editing and incubating this project, later this evening, she will talk more about her work with Lonnie Deere's poems and the work she did to bring this volume to Sinister Wisdom readers and to a larger readership in the world. I am also very grateful to have had these precious poems in my hands, thanks to Julie. 
Tonight, we will hear five speakers reading from Lanadier's poems and sharing brief reflections on her work. The readers in order are Stephanie Young, Rachel Levitsky, Kim Shuck, and Judy Gran. And, and finally, the editor of this volume, Julie Enser. I will provide a brief introduction of each speaker now, and we will put a longer bio in the chat as they speak. Then the readers will proceed with the order without further intrusion from me. If we're all ready, I'll start. Stephanie Young, her most recent book of poetry, Pet Sounds, won the 2020 Lambda Award in bisexual poetry. Her recent scholarship on the history of prestige, literature, culture, and its changing demographics, co-written with Claire Grossman and Juliana Spar, can be found at American Literary History, Public Books, ASAP, J, and the Post 45 Data Collective. Rachel Levitsky is a professor of writing at Pratt Institute and Naropa University Summer Writing Program. In 1999, she founded Belladonna, which is now Belladonna Collaborative. She's the author of Under the Sun, Future Poem 2003, Neighbor, UDP 2009, The Poetic Novella, and the sound, sorry, and the story of my accident is ours, Future Poem 2013. I am happy to see her again. Um, Kim Shuck is widely published in journals, anthologies, and a couple of solo books. In 2019, Shuck was awarded an inaugural National Laureate Fellowship from the Academy, Academy of American Poets and a Penn Oakland Censorship Award. And our foremother, Dr. Judy Gran, is in, internationally known as a poet, activist, and cultural theorist. Her writings have helped to fuel cultural feminist, gay, and lesbian activism since 1965. Brown's memoirs, A Simple Revolution, The Making of an Activist Poet, recounts her co-founding of the gay women's liberation movement in the Bay Area. And finally, Julie Enser is the editor and publisher of Sinister Wisdom. I hope you got to wave to all of them as they were highlighted on the screen. And without Further ado, I invite Stephanie Young to begin. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody at Sinister Wisdom. Uh, I am so happy and so honored to be here and to be celebrating this work. I just want to say congratulations to Julie. Um, I'm just, I'm so impressed. We, uh, Julie and I actually first connected when I was doing a project called Deep Oakland that was um, collecting and making available some PDFs of um, of actually, as it turned out, like a lot of lesbian feminist poetry that wasn't available. And I'm somebody who came through an MFA program in the 90s, and this is work that I had never heard of. And I am so grateful that this work is now going to be available for a generation of writers who are coming up. Um, I was actually, I've been, I work at Mills College, which you may know, um, has been acquired by Northeastern University recently. And I've been doing a lot of kind of digging around in the archives around some of Pauline Oliveros's archives. And um, there's been so many references to her relationship with Lillie. And I'm just like, it's just been bring, like bringing these moments together of, um, of work that that I I didn't know what these relationships were. And in fact, I think that might have, I think Oliveros might have been um, the first place that I really um, came to encounter this work. So it just, it feels like a lot of strands are coming together in this beautiful braid for me personally. And I think for all of us culturally as this work comes out. So huge thank yous. Um, I'm not gonna be a dorky professor. I feel like I'm at the beginning of the semester and it's like, now is the time when we read from our syllabi. I was like, can I read my blurb? No, that is too dorky to do. Um, but I do wanna say as somebody who is, I'm in Oakland, I'm in the Bay Area, I've been here for a long time, very interested in small press uh, poetry in the Bay Area and, and, and in the places where we wind up in these kinds of silos or these weird divisions, right? Between There's like formal innovation, there's language poetry, there's experimentalism, there's radical gay publishing, there's lesbian feminist publishing. And I think often these things are encountered separately by different scenes and different communities and their histories are also carried forward, um, not always in conversation. And I think this volume helps us bring those things into conversation, which is one of the things that I'm the, the most excited about, um, along with being able to encounter the whole kind of oeuvre of the work, um, seeing how seeing how the, all of those places are brought together, um, I, I think really complicates some received histories of Bay Area poetry that can get really static and really rigid. Um, 
so I think also too for the, the the ways in which this work is is providing crucial interventions in historiography of Bay Area poetry, just like thank you, Julie. <laughs> it's such a beautiful book. Um, so as a dorky professor, I am I do talk a little fast. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to read these poems with some more um, slowness. Um, but I, um, when I was thinking about what to read, and again, like for those of you who don't have it yet, big book, um, I, I, there were so many things I wanted to read. Um, but I find myself at the beginning of the semester, so I want to read um, a poem about summer. Uh, that happens to be followed by a poem about some of the the pains of higher education, <laughs> which is where I find myself in time. Um, so I am reading, for those of you who may have the book, um, I'm reading at page 303, um, in Crete, One Lives to Love to Live. Paradise Regained. You eat fast, I eat slow, I sleep nights, you days. You're a sex pot. I'm an it. I want to be with you in a room on an island where I sleep fast. You sleep slow. You eat nights. I daze. Without a brain, honey, I doubt you'd feel your heart. Paradise is a room on an island of continuing defining. When one feels this much love, when one feels this much, one should be allowed to as an aside, to lavish and language in deliciousness and fallowness of completion, be nursed and lowered into bed, our mushroom flesh alleviated and luxuriated, lower halves, staggering lips, musk, our liquid beings secreted into a hut with moon glow we absorb till white wave intervenes, separates us from death. Annunciation of time moves our catatonic bodies and eyes swim out of sight, each to her separate hut, slipped mead, dreaming honey cakes under pear half, peach half moon, till each one threads sunsets backwards and forwards, a built-in secretion that makes us raw and cranky as protection, snake dehibernation ready. When one feels this much love, one should be left upside down, lovesick. Our society is the sick part of love, saturated, unsatiable. In Crete, children drop flowers over our exposed bodies and adorned brief men and lithe musculars bring sauteed new caught fish that fleck like petals on our compost tongues, motionless feasting. Light sleeper, I am writing this so light won't enter her fragile cave while I am away brightly breathing. I wanted her to know the insides of my novel and red bucket before we dug up the sun and not throw sand. Poets are ridiculous, bold over romantics, defiant only slowed by a beach. Tears in a cuff of wind, she refused to say, it's all right, I still love you. Wavelet embraces two umber figures in all the world sunning, all the world someday. I left my heart in Berkeley. I had secreted my heart into my pocket. You can look for it though. Lockett knows the dark of a day, terribly beautiful to have you. Night tripper, I awoke you asked me to kiss you. I couldn't find your lips. Though sleep turned was I on my head. Tried to enter the headboard a number of times, thinking it was the way to the door. Languaging. You create lines without making, showing them. All I can do is listen to Willie Nelson, languishing, vacation music, and doing dishes in the endless Western stream. Housekeeper absent-minded, tucking the edges of TV city and vacation into a cream made bed. Poems never written. Poems, you said, never get written. They mosey in, throw their stetsons in corners, ask what's for chow, stretching their crude stocking feet over seamless flowered embroidered upholstery. 
They reek with bury me not whiskey and don't fence me in snuff, chucked in their dreamlessness. The sheriff whiffs out the swinging doors. They hightail it out of there, mining their gold teeth with picks, gauging their tether distance with a kind of hoss saunter into the gunpowder sunset. Wallpaper Town posts pictures of them, their prairie twang, echoing words of hipgate mystique in the center of zeros. The reward is the memory, hankering. I came home. I came home and was startled by white daisies. Three fairies had visited my house. I did the dishes. I left a note which Yin was hoping for, didn't expect to find and found right away. I made the bed and left a flower the color of my love on the pillow. Wing didn't have to do that. All day at work, people kept interrupting, thoughts of you, insisting happiness of a dream. Wing, a cross between wing and yang. Habits. I kept feeling old urgings of hurrying home to take care of the dog and realizing I didn't have to felt the panic of his void. You brighten the corners around here, placing mysteries on tables, his grace curve filling up with dried, thrown out flowers. I'm thankful for fairies and the cat misses observing your angel fur dog with curved strung bow and shaft of love arrows exercises. Certain days should be face days, certain days breast days, certain days back rub days, and other days of clitoris in Crete days, head days, mind days too, days leg, days hair, days air, days lip days, heart, daisy have to water the yard days, when did you get home days, birdie cat awaits the great white dog Artemis in the sky days, dew drop, bye. I hope that some people have had a summer like that. And then um, I'm going to end with the higher education poem, Higher Learning. It's called Brain Drain. And it's immediately the next the poem that follows what I just read. So it's 309. Uh, brain curled cobra like in a pan on the floor where we muddy Wednesday, Friday died in the formaldehyde lingering firmament. Science. Years I'd put off that man, that class, that brain belonging to the unclaimed. I do not think, therefore, I am not lying in trails outstretched to pallid students in paler smocks, holding stance of the anatomy lesson. Brain leaked a puddle, mirrored our head's island aspect, flood stuck graves, storm cloud sounds electricity, cauliflower gone out, fungus rumpled, base of a tree did not grow nor make the one in my head, stand out, misery piled there, commiserating requisites, the professor pointing out parts. Brain came unwrapped in class, gray linings aimed at skylights, old rope trick, escape. Slippery little mystery of a professor, head swaddled and kept, inched upward while we lay huddling, pained as worms across a place of learning. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful reading, Stephanie. I really, I was just thinking, wow, she's such a good poet. <laughs> um, and also, um, and also echoing everything you said about Julie's work and also this little bit, which is that for years I was trying to teach a woman is talking to death from an online platform and up pops Deep Oakland with not only a woman is talking to death, but the original facsimile edition from the Women's Press Collective, which is so beautiful with its, its drawings and the whole Deep Oakland project was something I discovered and then I just figured out it was you and I just wanna thank you again for Deep Oakland. And, um, so much gratitude um, to Julie. I um, first encountered Julie's massive project of producing these uh, rigorous, beautifully edited research uh, collected through the Pat Parker collected, and um, and we ended up talking. And I heard about this project years ago, and it's just more than I could have 
ever wanted. Uh, I love this book so much. Thank you, Julie, and um, all of you for being here. So I have a small selection that begins on page uh, 73 in the um, part of the book that is the female freeway. I think Julie will, will say later, but if someone can say in the chat, I think it's 1970. Um, and um, what I'm moved by in some of the things that I'm moved by in this in this selection of three poems that I'm going to read three pages really that I'm going to read is um Lona Dier's connection to Robert Duncan and Jess and not only the, her connection but also the way that her poetics do something that their poetics do which I love so much whereas something that these themes keep on coming up and back and leaving and sort of veering away while other things come and coming back. Um, and, um, and then there's some other joys that I'll, I'll, I'll mention as we go. So uh, Robert Duncan and Jess were uh, local heroes in San Francisco who were sort of famed for their domesticity. And one was a, po a poet with salons and one was, one was a poet, one was an artist. Stephanie could, pro could probably say so much more about them than me, but um, anyway, Robert, the poem is called Robert and Jess. The gift of gods belong to the gods. When I think of Robert and Jess, I hear angel whir, bodies constant in midair, a daguerreotype of mercury in flight, a hummingbird entering a keyhole, a cloud opening out a Bach trumpet, the opening at once of all the leather, bindings of the 1911 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Knowledge cross-eyed coming out a cellar, bursting through the first floor to the ceiling of a third light of Apollo. Robert's voices tremolo, spreading a three inch layer, thick of glow over old books, keeping them warm. And Jess fixing tea and fixing tea and fixing tea till it's known. The darkling darling of Victorian territories is very high. So much made necessary. Lonely in recording love, I think of pack rat, rabbit startled, gun shyness, and owl of an appetite, Robert Pooh Bear, Robert seated at the head of the round table, cutting pomegranates in half, saying seeds, saying cross section of stars, saying, red rain saying said from experience don't give a long uh, don't give a love poem to someone who doesn't know your love no matter how much i read robert's poem i only begin them i only begin to think of jess magnifying glass eyed over paintings packed layers of the last earth century beds of baroque doors hanging eyes shades on bone half Leaf lamps surrounded by key surrounded carpenters horns buried midway in unicorn carvings. Haley's comet crowning the sky, entering the tree of duality of the heart of a single signature, the embodiment R and J, because there are so few makes necessary the possibility. And this other thing that I love in the selection is the appearance of both in this case, Emily Dickinson who keeps on appearing as a character, as a muse throughout the, the volume. I was a teenage poet, age 32. If Emily Dickinson comes to town, if Emily Dickinson comes to town, tell me, town where Sappho jumped into the sea and Princess Anunka followed my muscular camera around until she dissolved, body slowly going backward, swathing. What was to be a super, super suburb eroded into the perfect place for the stumbling fellow, penis wrapped in bandages, worth recording. I even learned to walk like a mummy. My eyes sealed to camera's eye, cadmium batteries, Mini motors whirring images up like froth, the men in my lives, the time it took to lift an eyelid, gaze sideways in old 30s movies, reveal sharp incisors. Emily, I am saving myself for you. Hurry, 
before my body exed by men. I keep your longings in my closet. I haven't read a poem since you. I haven't written a poem since I ran out of poets, a preserved blonde. When Emily, if Emily comes to town, tell her, I'll run footage through her system like an endless snake, focus the constricting dream spots of her eyes, men flailing their absence inside the sp spiral spacesuits, airless planes, Emily's hunched, shuffling toward the beloved. And this last um, page that I'm gonna read comes from a section called Opening Dream, it looks like that. Um, and then the poem, it's like a six or seven page poem called, I Hear You Guarded Two Sex Say My Name. I Hear You Guarded Two Sex Say My Name. And one of the themes that goes through the hermaphrodite is really available here. And um, and you'll see it sort of, for those of you who like Kathy Acker, it sort of foreshadows Kathy Acker's work in some pretty interesting ways. My hermaphrodite was an abandoned baby found by a shepherd and raised as a boy until he started menstruating and his chest grew moons. The shepherd took the boy to the village. Ropes were slipped over the confused youth. Wood and leaves were heaped upon him and set afire. Your hermaphrodite women bring flowers to men, erect temples for men and women exchanging clothing in the shadow of the phallic altar erected by men brought flowers to by women. My hermaphrodite will bleed to death in a ward full of tangled organs if and half a man, half a woman isn't separated by the sterile implements of man. Your hermaphrodite has a woman's breasts and a man's penis covered by the Lady Museum's Restoration League and uncovered by the Museum Friends Society that the school teacher in quest of art hurries her tittering charges out of the room of my hermaphrodite is half Don Quixote, half windmill. I, a woman, attending a woman's liberation meeting, wearing a man's mask, flying a witch's flag over my crotch. The women wouldn't let me in the door. I, a member of which, W-I-T-C-H, the Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from hell. Well then, I took a different approach, I think, from other people um, in terms of picking poetry. It's such a great collection. I just opened it randomly to a page. And um, you know you've encountered a really great collection when you can almost play it like uh, reading tarot cards and you sort of come to a, a piece that means something. And... Uh, um, this is on page 285. It's called Poem for the Women's Philharmonic of the Bay Area. 18 years I haven't worn a dress. An orchestra ought to look like a rainbow and sound like slipping of sacral quilted skirts. Poignant, poignant as conch shells differing summoning, expanding, pitch, dresses of priestesses. Um, there are so many poets who to find them, you almost need a map and a dowsing rod. And um, for me, this was one of them. And I'm really grateful that... Um, that Julie uh, is bringing this work out. Uh, it was sent to me uh, to comment on, and I don't know if I said I I was aware of her work or not. I know I'd heard of her. Um, there's a little group of us who sort of grew up around poetry in San Francisco when uh, a lot of the old bookstores were still around. And I think I was talking 
<clears throat> I was talking to another of us and uh, she said, oh yeah, no, you do know this work. I was like, do I? Okay. Um, it was kind of delightful. It was the same conversation in which I was being told that I actually had to wear a dress um, to an event, which is always sort of funny because me in a dress is not more subtle. In fact, I look so out of place. I never look more butch than when I'm in a dress. So I really appreciated coming up with that particular poem. The other poem I'm going to read is called Cosmopolitan. It's on page 171. There is evidence they were here beneath the triangular hill, a shin bone clean of flesh, beneath that naked hill, a suit of flayed skin, houses stacked up until they lean together in corbelled arches at the top, suburbs devastating as ever, freeways agonizing at our backs, an accident on the road to the ruins, man with a cross of blood on his face, people stand around, jolly, fastened to the holy configuration, people everywhere attracted to such places, People of all races take their fingers to the maps to these places. X marks the cross on which Spaniards put the savior. Aztecs the sun, floating city of San Francisco and Mexico City, founded on a floating garden. Blue artery trees, sanguine veined flowers, Montezuma oversaw on banks of human salt. Diego Rivera moved in both cities. Where he moved, gigantic promise sprang around this floating man, fingertips of the living made inanimates move. He saw two cities together, two countries, the North and South American continents, one. Around him, tongue slithered, sinister utterances. Do not let him paint this picture in our city, Nelson Rockefeller told Diego, to remove a bloom from creation. Picasso knew better, Matisse knew better, did not let pigment from their fingers for the man. Diego weakened to trust, but refused to remove Lenin's face from life. Rockefeller paid Diego off, ordered the finished tropics smashed. This, the vice president of this country, and in the other country, the president allows people shot in the streets who are unhappy, it cannot belong to the living, the poor. There is evidence they are everywhere. In Diego's murals, beside Rockefeller's face painted in the mural, Diego repainted in his own country the mural Rockefeller murdered by remote control in this country, the poor, Rockefeller. There is evidence. So, um, I don't know, it's deep, it rewards deep reading and it's an incredible chunk of poetry and I'm really grateful for it. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, in. Hello. Um. Again, I would just want to join everybody else in thanking you, Julie, for putting this collection together. Uh, Lynn was very special. And um, am I on my own mic? Yeah. Uh, I, I chose a poem called The Python Cadillac. And like him, I, I just opened it um, after one that I thought I was wanted to read was read by um, somebody earlier. So um, the Python Cadillac is dedicated to, I don't know who, but they're called For the Lindas, women she knew. <clears throat> when I was little, my grandmother had a well, and in and around the well lived their small snakes called racers or chasers, they were harmless, but when you approached the well, they'd become aggressive, start running after you. When grandma saw how scared I was, she said, chase those racers right back. 
they'll run at you. But if you run at them, they'll turn around and run the other way. And it really worked. Mediterranean snake admitter. To admit the beauty of a snake, give it a room of its own. Place a statue of a woman holding lightning bolts on a ledge in the room. Put a low table made of red clay in the room, table balanced on three legs. Fashion the top of the snake table with four evenly spaced intersecting troughs to form a cross. In the intersecting point of the two sides of the cross, Hollow a hole for the feeding dish of the snakes to fit. Place the snake's food in shallow terracotta bowls. Leave out barley kernels, honey cakes, milk, grub worms, and pieces of cheese. Make a hollow clay pipe with holes for the snakes to crawl up and out onto ledges where each can rest or eat or bask, call the pipe snake tube. Little temple floors and hall archways with the notched plume ornament. Design the flounced skirt of the Chryselephantine goddess or the border of portable hearths or the tomb of the tripod hearth with the ornament of the notched plume. Paint the wave and dot pattern arterial red and the background a deep tawny wheat white. Recognize the rows of waves with intermittent dots. What you're creating is not a notched plume, but the design on the adder snake's back. Know the adder also as the cat snake but it solely eats lizards and mice. Learn the fangs on the sacred adder are too far back in its mouth to seize the limb of a human and deliver a deadly sting. Research that the adder is no longer found on Crete and the adder was once endemic to Crete. Regard the adder as the mother of the Sphinx Observe adder marks on wings of sphinxes and griffins. Be assured, the way priestesses held their snakes, they loved them. See the snake gazing up at her fondly. Feel that if a snake appears, it is a long lost intimate ancestor and you and your garden are entranced with the new skin of its entrance. One time, I was at a friend's and we were walking in the countryside. My friend had seen that we both had staffs to carry, wood sticks, and we came upon this huge snake stretched out across our path. It was as large as a boa constrictor and it wouldn't move. My friend indicated it was harmless, but neither of us chose to step across it. He said, Place your stick near the snake and pound. So we did. We started pounding. And the snake made a movement, inched forward, a little toward the woods. We kept following, tapping the soil with our staffs. The big snake kept reacting to our vibrations and would move a little each time, not try to escape or turn on us. It was implied that the snake liked the shaking of the soil the rhythm of it, maybe even our presence. We passed through the wooded area and became aware we were approaching a river. It's current rushing. The snake kept moving toward us, or toward it, sorry, bit by bit in a straight line, pound, pound, pound. When the snake reached the edge of the water, we thought it would turn and move back even become aggressive toward us to do so. But no, it rested its head, raised up its front half, almost like a cobra, glimpsing back, right back at us like a final comment, a kind of farewell gesture, as if to survey our inability to move forward.
transcend the situation, then slipped into the water and in an instant disappeared. The Cadillac of Snakes. Get that python Cadillac off the road and into the field where it belongs, girls. It's yours, much bigger than it needs be, but for beauty. Who needs traffic blocking traffic, girls? Not the python with Cadillac exterior, not the Cadillac with python interior. Methinks the sly, slimy qualities we attribute to the human's lower reptilian brain and are more in our much larger, higher brains. That portion of the brain that waxes lofty and makes some want to run for political office. You know, patriarchy that cakes the snakes and makes them extinguished. Like the San Francisco garter snake on the list of endangered species. I mean, what snake has ever run for president? Or viper tried for vice presidency? The three-leafed clover as a club. St. Patrick driving out the snakes in Ireland was the beginning of the end of ecological sense. Decry the loss of the natural enemy of mosquitoes aspire to cast aspersions with an aspergillum, which was horse's tail attached to a handle dipped in water and used before Christianity to anoint. Get off the male freeway and onto the trail of a gliding star guiding. She's got lightning, honey. She's got honey cakes, baby. The Python Cadillac's line stream to go. By starting her, you get going. Her starting herself, you get her going. Storm up a swim, cloud up a run. Her heart beats in your mirror. Reflective glass steams her hiss. Like children skimmering heat, she skitter wafts scaly night. No man dares snatch her. Her hand or pocket holds venom in a tube. She knows to use it, to throw it, to tower like those live dead women shaped like bells ringing so hard. They bowl you over while fork-tongued slither snakes and twine and wind them to a stately high, an impenetrable height, oh, of priestesses like boas, with arrows gliding their elongated stride. A snake rings your peaked hat, priestess, sucking its head out in front, sticking its head out in front. A third eye at the level of your forehead, onyxing wisdom. Your limbs lithe with snakes, three snakes, rhymed together to make your hair braid. Get that python Cadillac off the road and into the fields where it belongs, girls, much broader and longer and profounder than beauty. Thank you. And thank you for, and, and this is great to be here and listening to everybody and enjoying um, Lynn in a brand new way. Thank you so much, Judy. That's fantastic. And as someone pointed out in the um, chat, I couldn't resist not including, though they're very small, they're these wonderful photos of Lana Deer holding her pet garter snakes. Um, I'm sure there's a much, bigger story to tell about that. Um, before I read, I think I'm going to read um, just two two poems, maybe three. Uh, I want to thank um, Karis Books and More for co-sponsoring this and helping us spread the word about it. 
it is so wonderful to have uh, Karis as an ally doing work in the South, uh, particularly when there are so many attacks happening um, to LGBT, LGBTQ people today in the South. Um, I also want to thank Fred Alanadir, Lynn's brother, who is planning to be with us this evening um, and couldn't as a result of technology. We spoke before the um, event and I said, well, Mercury is in retrograde. So if you believe that, that's why you're having technology problems. But Fred really wanted to be with us this evening. And um, I want to thank him for when he watches this for granting the permissions to put this volume together and for being such a great um, collaborator, collaborator and interlocutor on the project. I first encountered Lynn Lanadier while I was doing research at the San Francisco Public Library in the papers of Barbara Greer. Um, and Lana Deer has a poem um, that she uh, that that references Greer, and I'm just going to gesture to it. It's on page four um, four hundred and twelve. It's called Barbara Greer and Friend. I don't have time to read it, but it's really a delightful one. Um, I'm going to read the poem "Female Impersonators and Humorless Feminists," um, which um, many of the poems uh, in this. Um, in this volume, which I've been, I feel like I've been living with for about 10 years when I first started reading Lana Deer. Many of them have been great traveling companions for me, especially over the past uh, six months um, as we've had some um, humorless feminists associated with sinister wisdom. So this is female impersonators and humorless feminists. Out woman out, throw the word woman out. It is a bag they inflate, that man of womb, they stick fake hair on, that wooden fluff of viciousness they swear is us, that sack with sex parts carrying around picture of water, the dumb clothes females are seen in our trappings when you learn they came from the mailman. I laugh to be alive at men, resurrecting the idea of us from nightly redeeming imaginings. They imitate dumb holes in clodhoppers, pawing their way toward animal stage of ridicule, as if the carcass of cloth twas Christ, how they strut at the promise of cinched waist. I dare a man to be me. Let female impersonators dress in men's clothes, research pre-Mediterranean cultures, glean female history, the likes of which sends them into falsettos, shake out this rag before the storm breaks. I want to see a man do more than put on. I don't want to be called womb named after man. I'd rather be me, a relaxed transvestite, enactment of a female body alert to its mind. I want to laugh and show life at scientists amazed to unearth women's minds work faster and more accurately than men's purple cow phone home. In intelligence out, a crone in the air with no name conducts with jest a dish, a spoon, a cow, the moon, all things spilled, stay in the pitcher, fly in the wake of mimicry, wake once meant humor, humor once meant moisture, fluid, wet, wake, humor now means to adapt to or comply with the mood of another till violence becomes. Yes, Virginia, there is an utopia in a sea of brain fluid, a light, a lost island where trace of us is being dug up. She, he checks in at intelligence end, carries her own bags to a disquieting room, papered with whimsy of urns. Um, Lana Deer was in conversation. One of the things, and, and people have referenced it, one of the things I love about this poetry um, is that she was in conversation with so many different poetic formations, um, including the lesbian feminist poetry coming out of the Bay Area, um, and also lots of other poetic movements, language poetry, um, her relationship with um, Robert and Jess. Um, and so I wanna read, um, from page 450, a poem that she wrote to Gloria Anzaldúa. Uh, it's called Tree Mediums and Spanish Visitations. In Aeolian light, 
I picture you photographing the olive grove. I picture you photographing the olive grove. I walk past daily talking to my dog and breathing deep green leaves, silver on the undersides, pungent as stilettos while meeting lots of lesbians walking assorted dogs. And I am in Crete listening to the clicking of needle necklaces of priestesses visiting bee orchards, dream, dream ground a powdered history, moon darkened music o oh, olives, sun round leaves, gentled exclaimings in the glint wind. I mean this poem to be in Spanish, but I am a warp away from a learning time. Four o'clock, my dog started yapping. I headed to the door of someone knocking, heard knocking, opening the knowing door. I would have sworn twas you, Gloria. Twas nobody but bees in fragrant toppings of my yard. Not a soul, not even expecting evangels distributing captions in, ecclesiast in ecclesiastic mode. Que me pasa? Esta fue tu vida? I couldn't catch even sight of restoration of the haunts of Eden. Pre-Eden, egalitarianism hunts me walking the olive grove time warp trees, haunted by park and rec department spray cans in a pit bull neighborhood. Branches, let the wild Spanish my learning Spanish begin, velvet sunlight, shadow my shoulders realization, and is in shape of a lyre. The handheld harp preceded golden Greeks by silver centuries, pocked trunks centuries daily assume personified woodland shapes, nymphs, lizards, lakes, streams, Dark turned days, I read the history of Spanish anarchy. Dream, Emily Dixon, Dickinson is alive and plying poetry to the oil light of evening on and on into the harp playing wind of pre-Dorian, Ionian, Phrygian, Lydian night strings of an Aeolian harp tuned low to vibrate themselves in wind, create harmonic overtones, offset wired, man-made night. Tremulous, olivaceous, forbearance by female dwelling in the maze, that dwelling in the maze, that dwelling in the maze, that tenders hearts greenery. Um, and I'm going to end with the final poem of the collection, which is on page uh, 493. It is called um, Lesbian Heaven. Um, and I'll end. And then I think Shimona has a couple words and we'll have our final song. Lesbian Heaven. All the girlfriends you ever went with are together now. And they're all getting along. They're lovers of each other. And you're in the middle playing the lyre with Greek attire in the middle of a Maxfield Parish forest. Doe-eyed nymphs fondling pan pipes while the pure note sounds. Purple mountains rise over Aeolian forests and the wind is the pianist for a women's chorus. And the longest fingered of all the women plays the lute. Pluck the cord, pour the wine. The flute chambers Egypt's of desire and the glimmer bubble gurgles of a brook where each stone is smooth to the consistency of knees and thighs and the sun, a giant pearl, livens them. Lesbian heaven is filled with dogs and cats all the pets we've ever had are tendered by the hands that kept them and they all behave. A beloved company among pillars uplift and glitter. Whereas Diana sets down her hunting implements and all the lesbians in heaven clamor to her limbs with tambour touch. 
The afternoon unfolds its leaf. The night cadenzas its embrace. The stars become the beaded necklace of morning with the moon as centerpiece. And the gold of the painting shineth on me and thee. Thank you to Stephanie, Rachel, Kim, and Judy for reading. Thank you so much to Shimona for do, being the MC this evening. And I turn it back over to her. Thank you so much, everyone. To, the readings were so delightful and I'm grateful I got to hear all of Lynn Wanadier's poems from you. Um, if you do not already have your copy of Sinister Wisdom 129, um, Fire Rimmed Eden, and you are a subscriber, it is winging its way over to you. If you want to order a copy, please order online at sinisterwisdom.org slash Lynn Thank you so much for gathering with us. And if you want to revisit these readings, which I definitely will be, uh, the video from this e event's evening, oh, even, evening's event, <laughs> will be available at the Sinister Wisdom website tomorrow or Thursday. Please look for the link in the chat. For our final song, we have The L Word by songwriter Carol Kramer, performed by Your Girlfriend and produced by Esther Records. As you listen to the music, stand up and dance, and we will highlight the videos, Dance Like You're in Lesbian Heaven. When the music ends, I will end the Zoom call. Thank you all for joining us, and now let the dancing begin.
Nada. Thank you all. We'll see you in a couple weeks for more great events this fall.